In this series of videos, we're going to begin investigating chemical bonding and molecular geometry. And these are foundational ideas really for understanding molecular structure. So we're moving from a larger scale appreciation of how chemical substances behave, things like thermochemistry and stoichiometry, down to the single molecule level and beginning to understand how and why atoms are linked to each other, what the character of those linkages is, and how atoms can be bonded in various different ways how we represent molecular structure using various drawings, pictures, etc., and how we think about structure in three dimensions, appreciating the geometry of molecules as they exist in three-dimensional space. So overall, we're going to talk about the two most important types of bonding, first ionic and covalent bonding. Then we'll get into drawing Lewis structures, representing atoms as Lewis symbols and linking those together to create Lewis structures. We'll talk about particular aspects of Lewis structures in formal charges and talk about limitations of the Lewis structural model with resonance and the fact that Lewis structures are really just a human formalism at the end of the day and there's nothing too special about them and they are an incomplete representation of reality as is the case for many human endeavors. In the fifth section, we'll talk about the strengths of ionic and covalent bonds, how we think about those, how we represent those in quantitative form and work with them, and enthalpy will make a return in that section. And then we'll talk about molecular structure and polarity, connecting molecular structure in the form of the Lewis structure to the three-dimensional geometry of a molecule and inferring the polarity of the molecule from that, which is a measure of the dis or asymmetric distribution of charge within the molecule. Ionic bonds exist in substances that contain ions, atoms or polyatomic particles containing charge. And ionic bonds simply involve the electrostatic attraction of opposite charges, right? Opposites attract. So positive and negative charges in cations and anions are attracted to each other, and that is the essence of an ionic bond. The strength of an ionic bond can be represented using lattice energy, which is the energy required to essentially pull apart the cations and anions in a solid ionic compound into the separated gas phase. And this is universally endothermic as it takes energy, generally a great deal of energy, to separate ions in an ionic lattice like this. The strengths of ionic bonds really at the end of the day are rooted in Coulomb's law. So in thinking about how strong a given ionic bond is, or looking at the relative strengths of two ionic bonds, we want to look at the terms that appear in Coulomb's law, which measures the strength of attraction between two charged particles, or repulsion if the charges are of the same sign. Looking at Coulomb's law, we can make some inferences about this. And specifically, we can infer that stronger ionic bonds are associated with greater charges. Here we're representing that as Q. So greater magnitude of charges, plus 3, minus 3, for example, are attracted more strongly than plus 1 and minus 1. And also smaller ionic radii, smaller ions whose centers are closer to one another, are more strongly attracted to one another than larger ions. And we can see that in Coulomb's law in that R shows up in the denominator. So the smaller this value is, the larger is the energy of the bond and the stronger it is. Now is a good time to note that the ionic charges in monatomic cations and anions follow patterns that we can infer from the periodic table and electron configurations. Main group cations, which are cations derived from atoms in groups 1, 2, and 13, tend to be derived from loss of all the valence electrons to form the configuration, the electron configuration, of the nearest noble gas. So for example, lithium plus has the configuration of helium, magnesium two plus is neon, aluminum three plus is also neon, and on the anion side, these relatively electronegative non-metal atoms tend to gain electrons to reach the closest noble gas to form anions. So O2 minus, for example, has the configuration of neon, Cl- minus has the configuration of argon, and Br- minus has the configuration of krypton. Keep these ideas in mind. It's a way to infer ionic charges and ionic compounds, which is needed, for example, for assessing lattice energy, relative strengths of ionic bonds, and, and that kind of thing, and thinking about the reactivity of ionic compounds. Covalent bonds are an entirely different ballgame. Covalent bonds involve electron sharing between two nonmetal atoms, generally. 
The two atoms share that pair of electrons, and those electrons are mutually attracted to both nuclei involved in the bond. A typical introduction to a covalent bond starts with the idea that when I take two non-metal atoms, let's imagine these are hydrogen atoms, at a large separation distance they have some energy associated with the energies of the separated atoms. But as I bring those closer together and decrease this internuclear distance, the distance between the nuclei, the energy of that pair of atoms goes down until I reach a minimum at which point we can say that the atoms are at their equilibrium bond length, usually just called the bond length. For hydrogen, it's 74 picometers. At that point, pushing the atoms closer together results in an increase in energy because now the electron clouds are starting to repel one another. At the equilibrium bond length, we've minimized the energy by balancing essentially that attraction of the electrons to the nearby nuclei and the electron-electron repulsion that begins to build in as the atoms approach one another. That kind of ideal point, this minimum on a graph of the internuclear distance and the energy, is called the bond length. Just as we saw in the case of ionic bonds, an energy input is required to cleave covalent bonds. In other words, cleavage of covalent bonds is always an endothermic process. It takes energy to break bonds. So for example, it takes 436 kilojoules to cleave an H2 molecule into two separate hydrogen atoms in the gas phase. On the flip side, if we reverse this process or think about it backwards, the formation of covalent bonds is always exothermic. Energy is always released. And naturally, when I take two hydrogen atoms separated in the gas phase and I allow them to approach one another to form an H2 molecule in the gas phase, the enthalpy change associated with that is negative 436 kilojoules per mole. 